<laughs> so this was how we, we programmed, right? We, we sat at the desk and we had these books on our desk and we suffered. And what happened when you got stuck? You went and hopefully had a co-worker. That was the only way. You went to the bookstore and helped with another book. <laughs> yeah, you actually, yeah, you walked to the bookstore and helped. Uh, uphill in snow. In the, yeah, <laughs> with, the, with the gimpy leg. Uh, and we did work like this. That was that was where it was. There's no telesense. There was no uh, syntax highlighting. There was just there was only pain and pointers <laughs> and triple vision. <laughs> yeah. The, the social interaction is kind of all fundamentally around wandering around the office. But more and more of us are working remotely. I work from home. I don't actually work in uh, in Redmond. A lot of people assume that when I went for my, went, to, went to work for Microsoft that I moved to Seattle. So I work from home. My commute is downstairs. So I don't, I don't get to do that. And as much as I go to coffee shops and Starbucks and use wireless, walking up to random strangers and asking them how to aggregate the free-threaded Marshall uh, really doesn't work. Uh, I can usually find another computer geek, uh, but it's just not quite the same. So um, as a developer, I am always searching for kind of my third place. You guys know what the developer theory of the third place, right? The idea that there's home, there's work, and there's a third place. And that third place is where you derive your energy. It may be church, maybe the the Y or community center, um, and it may be just, you know your local Cheers bar or whatever. And the theory of the third place is that unless you have that defined place, that, that you can't be a complete person. Now, does anyone here have to have a, another third place that they can think of that they, they go that's not home or work? Standing out in the river with a fishing pole. Fishing, perfect example. And you may solve a problem by going out there. You may have a, have something that you just can't figure out. You go and you wait for the fish, and then the problem comes. The answer comes to you. Under the stars. Under the stars. Astronomy. Astronomy. Yeah. So a hobby can be a third place. It involves some aspect of community, whether it be taking your kid out on the boat or whether it be hanging out with a bunch of star people or whatever you guys do. Something like that. Um, but uh, interestingly, uh, nerds will try to interact with other nerds without actually ever touching them. And uh, early computers, uh, there's always that kind of attempt to uh, have two nerds talk to each other without seeing each other. So you remember doing this kind of stuff, doing talk. You've probably done this in, in college or doing that. And you had to know the guy's IP address. Just like, you know, talk and the name of the host, talk and the name of the IP. And suddenly you, you pop up and then get a nice little split screen. And this was amazing. When this happened, the first time I did this, I thought this was <coughs> unreal, you know. It's been, I thought I was talking to God or Alice or somebody. Um, that was uh, a beginning of, of social networking on the, uh, on the web. How many people did bulletin board systems, BBSs, dialing up, right? Getting into door games. Also, that was a show, that, that's a social network. So we had, we had those books, and we'd sit there, and we'd work, um, uh, work our software. Uh, and then MSDN happened, and these boxes started to show up. And then how good a developer you are depended on how fresh your disks were. <laughs> oh, you're on April? Dude, August. The August disks are way better than the April disks. You need to get those. And then they would give you a box like this. You would swap disks all day long. And then MSDN became this copy of uh, the sum of all human knowledge that we would all have. And if you didn't have a subscription, then you would be dead. And we don't really quite remember when that option for online help versus offline help kind of merged. You know, there was a time when it was painful and you didn't want the online help because it was too slow. You know, do I want to go out to the modem or do I want to just use the local cache? And then something happened and then the disk stopped coming, but the knowledge was, <coughs> was still there, right? Remember Pointcast? Sure. I just wanted to throw in Remember Pointcast because I thought that's just an awesome thing. When, when RSS happened, when blogs happened, I was like, hey man, I was doing this in like 94. This was, Pointcast was like the first RSS reader and they pulled structured data down, except XML I don't think had been invented at this point. And uh, this thing would run on Windows 3.1 as a screensaver. And it became such a problem uh, from a bandwidth perspective that it was banned at almost all corporations because it was point to point. We had one 28.8 modem that the hundred of us shared Right? And we hooked up CC mail. And when you wanted to send an email, it wasn't instantaneous. You had to wait a half an hour or so because all the mail was queued up in the outbox, right? The, the, the company's outbox. We used to pull information out. So there wasn't the infrastructure to do any kind of real sophisticated social networking. And then 
as a Microsoft person, the, the irony of, of the creation of Google was that all developer documentation at Microsoft is filtered through Google. Right? I mean, if Google wanted to beat Microsoft, what would they do? They would just stop indexing our developer documentation, and then it would be over. Right? How many people here think that in their heart of hearts, and you can just raise your hands and no one will look at you, many people won't look at you, um, that if Google went away, you would probably not be able to program anymore? <laughs> Duh. I think that, well, some people think IntelliSense is the crutch, right? That, that using syntax highlighting is where, where, you, where you become <coughs> mentally uh, crippled. Uh, it was, it's, in fact, Google. Without Google, without the kind of the bathroom wall of code that you can find as you search around the web for snippets, uh, I don't think I could code anymore. I think that that part of my brain does no longer works. If you want to try an experiment sometime, is literally unplug that network cable for uh, eight hours and try to get anything done. Seriously. It's a really interesting experiment to, to, to ask yourself, do I really know? Turn off IntelliSense. Oh. Oh, no. no, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> uh, a survey recently by a place called Evans Data that said that 75% of devs use more than one uh, social network. But the reason that I wanted to talk a little bit about this today is that it's my belief that a lot of people aren't using social networks effectively. I think that that, that LinkedIn thing was an example. Yes, it's possible to, to pull a job out of LinkedIn. Uh, the, the idea of being a couple of levels of indirection from somebody, <coughs> if you're in a particular industry, you're working in insurance and you want to find a, someone in insurance, you can do that on LinkedIn. But the way that you approach that individual, the way that you hook up with them, uh, can really make or break the deal. You know, I don't think the CTO of an insurance company necessarily wants a blind email from me saying, hey, we're like six degree friends. You know, you know Oprah, I know Oprah, I should come and work for your, for your company. Um, additionally, a lot of people uh, are on Twitter. How many people said are on Twitter? About 15, 20 percent? Uh, but it's still kind of the, the, the jury's still out about whether that makes you a better developer. So the discussion that I wanted to facilitate today was whether or not social networking makes you a better developer. Because Google is a one-way experience. You go out there, you search for something, and you get the information back. But you don't know if that code is any good. That's why I call it the back of the wall of code. You find some code on Google. How many people have ever copy-pasted code they found on Google directly into production? Uh. Yeah, you know you've done it. Don't even not raise your hand. Liars. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a reasonable algorithm, you know? For each, for each, for each. It's only three deep. Let's just uh, paste that directly into production. You, you know, it's no different than if you went to the bathroom and you found that for loop scratched on the wall in pen and then just copied it down and pasted it into production. There's no, there's no uh, in conversation there. There's just you grabbing information. Now, 90% of developers use blogs and only 70% trust them, which was really interesting. So it started me thinking about social networking as this, uh, this kind of web of trust. But I find a lot of information on blogs, but it's really difficult for me to figure out yeah, you know, is this guy's blog is pretty, and he has a custom theme and a cool, you know, graphic someone made in Photoshop. But is that code any better than <coughs> the code that the guy with the default theme is using? And one of the things that I thought was really interesting was this idea that a large number of people felt that moderation of those, uh, those that information is key. Someone to go in and basically, uh, for lack of a better word, be a bullshit detector. So one of the, so we can talk about a couple of different things, uh, and again, I want you guys to. to I can show you some, uh, some like how I do it. I can show you how how I use Twitter, how I use blogs. I can show you if how many people, how many people have a blog. Okay, why do the rest of you not? Procrastination. This is a really good thing to start with. Actually, procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay. It takes time. It takes time. Okay, so it takes time to update and maintain. What would you guys say if I said that every single professional developer should have a blog, period? What? Do you write, so you write software for a living, and you write specs, so you write for a living, right? So writing a blog is a way to write, get, get that technical thought, the technical thought out there, right? But you're writing for a large audience. I think that developers should have a blog because they should conserve their keystrokes. How many of you write daily emails that are more than four or five paragraphs long? Are you telling me you guys just don't run one line? Going to the store. 
<laughs> Pretty much. No one writes more than a paragraph anymore, apparently. Sure. I know. I, know. I am surprised by that. Um, I think that conservation of keystrokes, so this gentleman said it takes time. I think that it takes more time for me to waste my time sending an email to one person or a distribution list that has only 10, 15 people. But if you look at the number of people you touch versus <coughs> keystrokes, you know, how many people are you touching when you slap the keyboard? If I'm going to write one, two, three, four paragraphs to one, two, three, four people, that could just as easily go into a blog post. You, see, you know the guy at work who who's replies to all to those distribution lists and write these kind of amazing diatribes <coughs> that kind of flow into exchange and then they're kind of they're gone a week later. That information is completely lost. I think that we as developers have a great deal of information that's trapped in the brain and we are wasting keystrokes as we send that to one person or two people. Plus, I don't think that we're exercising enough the, the, the muscle of writing good descriptions of technical problems and solutions. I think that the argument that it takes time, you should ask yourself the next time you're on paragraph two of a long email and say, was this, is this the number of keystrokes required to get that information out? And could it have been disseminated to a larger, a larger crowd? Is the reason that Microsoft people can blog and not get canned is that we're not stupid, right? Because the stupid people already got fired for blogging. <laughs> <laughs> when, a, when in my this is my opinion, right? all of this all of this is my opinion. That's another way you can get out of this, right? That when any time I get into something with legal at Microsoft, I show them at the bottom of my blog where it says this is my opinion, and not in any way the opinion of my employer. When I speak, it's me speaking. It's not Microsoft speaking. But um, when uh, when when a company says you shouldn't blog because you might do something stupid, they are having a parent-child relationship with you, right? Are we all adults? We are all reasonably well-paid professional engineers and managers. The assumption is that you're not a child. And if you do do something stupid on a blog, then you should probably be fired, right? This, this isn't a problem at Microsoft because <coughs> we blog smart. And I think that we can convince slowly, you know, corporate management that that someone um, at Goldman Sachs that's blogging about .NET and they don't ever put anything that has anything to do with financial information or proprietary information can, can happily uh, you know, represent themselves. And you can certainly blog without ever mentioning who you work for. When I say every professional developer should be blogging, I think it exercises the writing part of the brain. It exercises the disseminate information without getting fired part of the brain. I think that you can put up a blog, you can do it without your name, you can do it without your company. Um, I used to blog, I used to work for Carillion Check Free, and I used to blog 20 and 30 line snippets of code all the time while working for banks all over the world. And no bank and no manager ever said a word to me because I didn't put Bank of New York dot system dot strings in the, you know, it didn't, it wasn't obvious. It was certainly not proprietary. It was about general dot net stuff. I said, I did this for six years. No one said squat. And I think until you actually do it, and push push the, the boundary a little bit. Somebody told me once at Microsoft that if you're not almost getting fired twice a year, then you're probably not really doing your job as well as you could be. And that seems like kind of a smarmy thing to say, but I think it was really true. Because you want to you want to push the limit, and it's those people that, that I think move to the next level. And that's one of the things I want to talk about a little later is personal brand management. So if you've got a blog, you should be using LiveWriter. It is the greatest thing since God talked to Moses. Um, this is a great little blog editor that's free from Microsoft. And one of the things that's really powerful about it is that it's got a plug-in model. And uh, the plug-in model, let me zoom in over here. These are some plugins that I've added for doing things like pasting in code without having to have much trouble, pasting in screen captures. LiveWriter will interface with nearly any blogging platform, so whether you're using Blogger or WordPress or DOS Blog or Subtext or whatever. So for me, I install Visual Studio, Outlook, and LiveWriter. That's like my bare machine setup. And I keep a lot of draft posts around because I, I just anything that I think might uh, want to be you know interesting. I'm I'm writing up that. I mean I, I'm writing my thoughts in here. It's kind of like almost like 
not quite one note, but it's like, uh, you know, I think an essay needs to be written on this, and I'm not quite sure what it looks like. Rather than firing up an email or firing up one note, I fire up LiveWriter, and I put those drafts in there. It may turn into an email, or it may turn into a white paper that I'll disseminate, or it might go up on the blog. That's one way, taking notes as blog posts, taking your thoughts, and when you're on the subway, writing them in uh, an application like LiveWriter is a really good way to get started blogging. You, you have more time than you think. Think about all the time you're wasting sending emails. Put it in a blog post and then send a link to that. Is a really good way to get, um, get people involved and interested. Now, one thing I wanted to show you guys was that since this was going to be a talk on uh, social networking for developers, um, I went up and I posted a question on uh, Stack Overflow. So I looked to me like not a lot of you were familiar with Stack Overflow, so I'll give you a quick overview. You guys all know what forums are, you all know what blogs are, you all know what, uh, what wikis are, right? So Stack Overflow is all of that at the same time. They are, the way that they describe it is they say, like, that's a blog, and that's a forum, and that's a wiki, and that's Stack Overflow. Right? <coughs> Because we all use Google to get answers to our questions, but we're counting on the, the full text indexing aspect of Google in order to get the information that we want. But ultimately, we have a question we wanted answered. So we're taking this full text indexing global search thing that's generic, that answers questions like how tall is Oprah, uh, you know, and what is the population of Zimbabwe, and we're applying it to searching for code snippets and namespaces and stuff like that. Stack so Overflow. Um, is focused entirely on getting answers to programming questions. It's not a forum where you sit around and chat about stuff and then hunt for the information. It's not a blog where one person says something and some people can comment. And it's not a wiki in that it's not completely chaos and anyone can do anything that they want. It's kind of all of those things. So someone can go in, so I just logged in, I use OpenID to log in, and it's easy to make a thing you can see. I've got some number here associated with my name. And one of the things that Stack Overflow does to, uh, to be successful is it, it, it forces us to play a game that we don't know that we're playing. You guys have Xbox or PlayStation? You know the, uh, the achievements that you get? You know, got to level 10 and a little badge says, level 10 achievement, Ta -da! and then that badge gets put on your profile. You get badges on Stack Overflow for achievements. <coughs> So, I've got 12 silver badges and 24 bronze badges in my profile. How did I, how did I get those? Let's look at my profile. I started seven months ago, and I have badges like good answer. I can hover over that and it says, this answer was upvoted 25 times. The notion of active moderation has been introduced on the web recently on sites like Dig and sites like um, Reddit. And this is the idea that I can either what's called up mod or down mod something. And I, that's those little arrows that point up or down where you just click up or you click down to say whether you like something or whether you don't. Here this is saying that this is a good answer and enough people have clicked the up button that now I got, an, I got a little achievement. So that means I answered a question and it was a good answer. I got a nice, nice question. Let me see your notable question. Let's see what that one is. So I asked a question and it got viewed 2,500 times. So not only was it uh, you know, well thought of, but it was also notable and a lot of people saw it. Here's one. Self-learner. Answer your own question. First accepted answer on your own question. Is that a plant? Uh, what's that? Is that a plant? A plant what? On the answer to your own question. No, no, no. no. <laughs> none, of, none, none of this is a plant, or I'm not, I'm not gaming the system here. You can see that I've, I've voted up a lot of stuff, and I've voted down a bunch of stuff. And it's just a matter of saying, I like it, I don't like it. There's not a bunch of forms to fill out. You just click an up arrow or a down arrow. And it's self regulating, so it's kind of an organic system. I can see the answers that I've answered. I've answered 48 answers. 
for any questions. And I've asked for questions. One of the questions that I've asked was, how can social networking sites make you a better developer? Which was the topic of this talk. And it looks like I asked this last night after dinner. And it's gotten almost 1,000 views. And 35 people have answered. And I can see that since I logged in last, there's 35 new answers and 10 new comments. So it tells me what's happened on the site since I've been here. This site is run by Jeff Atwood, uh, who runs CodingHorror.com, and Joel Spolsky, who's a uh, famous New Yorker. So I say, I'm giving a keynote at Discovery tomorrow at 9 a.m., and I'm totally screwed, and I need help. Uh, and I asked him some questions. So there's some interesting things that are going on here that really kind of represent the social aspect of the web. So 19 people have voted this up. They said, this is good. I like this. <laughs> but there's controls in place, so I can't artificially pump things up. Look at this here. Three people have voted to close the question because they think it's a stupid question. But we need five in order to completely close the question. When closed, no more answers. Now, there's been 14 comments, not answers, but comments about this question, including, uh, I wonder why two people have voted to close this. That's mean. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, it feels like Stack Overflow is getting some of the mean that you get when you're on Wikipedia. So then a discussion kind of happens here about, you know, this is a crappy forum. And then they basically come up and they say, well, don't take your dog out because you don't take it out on your dog because you can't catch mice. That's not what a dog is for. <laughs> they're basically saying that I'm complaining that this is a forum, and they're saying it's not meant to be a forum. This is meant to get answers to questions. So you get these interesting kind of discussions and arguments about stuff. Now, this is meant to be a place where you ask technical questions and get technical answers and then vote. So I'm a little bit cheating here. But obviously, it's interesting enough to the people because a thousand people have viewed it, 19 have voted it up, and I've got 35 different answers. Now, as the answerer, as the asker, rather, of the question, then I have to then mark one as answer. So if someone says, you know, I want to know how to open a file in C Sharp, and then you look at all the answers and then you mark one, and then that person gets some reputation. That's what that number after my name was. And that's the relationship. You ask questions, you answer questions, and then you kind of find yourself kind of subconsciously wanting to get those little achievements without really consciously going, going after them. This seems to be by far, out of 35 answers, the most popular one. And this guy makes the observation about jogging. He says that what he likes about social networking is that it makes him a better developer by making him realize that he's not the best developer that he knows. When he was all alone, working on his own, he thought he was a great developer. Social networking sites allowed him to realize really where he was. And the example that he gives is that, you know, you go out jogging a couple times a week, and amongst all your friends, you are the best jogger ever. My brother is a Portland fireman, and he's about 6'3", and he's not only got a six-pack, he's got like an eight-pack. It's crazy. The pack just can, keeps going. And he does Ironman triathlons. And I, you know, I always talk about how he's just this beast of a man, and he rides uh, 100 miles in his, on his bicycle. And he actually commutes back and forth from work 50 miles. He thinks this is great. His firemen work every third day, so every third day he rides 50 miles to work. And then he decided to go and do some competitions. And he's like 29th out of 40 when it comes to you know like people who are serious about this. So in my peer group, my brother is the most physically fit individual that I have ever seen. And he is in Oregon an average to below average cyclist. For this gentleman, by going on the web, he found out that I used to think I was a great developer. I was the best one in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I was the best, you know, even in college. There's a reminder that other people out there are really leaps and bounds ahead of me. This question and this answer has resonated with the people on Stack Overflow that that really crystallized why you should be involved in social networking. To have that humbling experience that I'm not uh, as big a badass as I thought it was. That makes him a better developer. So going down and look at some of the other answers here. This guy says, 
content-oriented sites make you a better developer, but Twitter is noise. I disagree. But that was interesting. Anyone else who believes otherwise is deluding himself to indulge in procrastination? <laughs> Saying that going up on Twitter and seeing a chat with some people is wasting time. I disagree. I am not alone. A good feeling when you're stuck with legacy systems. I think it you guys have probably stuck in some instances with legacy systems. We all know that 90% of the world's business logic runs in Excel, Excel macros and VBA, and the rest of it runs on mainframes. Loosely coupled with lots of developers. Let's keep going. There's another one I wanted to find. Why nerds are unpopular. I don't know why this guy, so I'm going to vote that up. I think that's a good one. This is a thing that uh, Paul Graham wrote. <coughs> He talks about popularity and what's wrong with nerds. And I want to show you a part of it. And this is really interesting. Right there. And this is a really interesting point of contention around programmers when I talk to programmers about this topic. It takes effort to be popular. So nerds, and that would be you guys, because you're at a conference uh, about programming on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> nerds uh, don't find value in popularity. As much as we complain and we sit in the other table where the non-popular kids are and we complain about why we're not popular, they don't actually realize that the popular people are putting effort into it. And when we find out the effort involved in being popular, well, we look down on them. Oh, I'm not going to play that game. That's not valuable. I'm too busy being smart. I'm going to spend my time uh, with my 20-sided dice and uh, become, <laughs> become better at something more valuable. This idea that it doesn't, that it takes work to become popular is, uh, I give the arguments to people because I say that as a developer, you should have a blog. And a lot of you were like, nah, nah, I don't have time, why should I do that? That's a specious statement, why would you say that? And then I start talking to developers about personal brand management. Oh, then you get into all sorts of trouble. Personal brand, blah, blah, blah. You ever like interview a guy uh, where you Googled for them and they didn't exist? And then you mention it to them in the interview and they, oh, I don't find any value in that online crap. I, I, my developer skills should stand alone, right? I'm awesome and just because I haven't got a blog, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that, I, that any my, you know, what I do is any less valuable. That is true. Unfortunately, they're not popular. And then you have to look past that. You have to ask yourself, and I'm interested to the, to the group here, if you had two resumes, identical resume, everything on the resume is exactly the same, except one person you've heard of, they, hello? Yeah. That was weird. Somebody's phone is telling us uh, that it's time for lunch. Sort of like a nap. Um, and uh, two resumes, identical resumes, and one of them, you've heard of the person, they're at the user groups, they, uh, they've written a couple of cool papers, they may be involved in some open source stuff, and when you Google, you find that they are known as a nice and helpful and kind individual. And the other one doesn't exist on Google, zero results. Which one do you hire? How do you, how do you compete with that? What are the good things and the bad things about that? Environmental history, you have to solve problems on the day. Yep. And I think that's what it is. Some people say, oh, well, you're talking about gaming the system, Scott. You're talking about consciously managing your personal brand, which I am. But what you just described is the best way to put it, which is someone who is online, someone who's got 15 years of curious Usenet postings, is a thoughtful and curious individual who's using all of the things at their disposal to find out more about the world. They're leaving footprints that show that they use this medium effectively. Now, whether you choose to actively manage that or not is kind of the boundary about whether you become a social media networker type personality, right, which is what all the popular kids became, or whether you're just a programmer who's trying to, to use, the, use the web, which uh, we had an interesting discussion in the hallway about books. Someone's like, oh, I love your books. Oh, I've read your books for years. They're fantastic. It's amazing. I can't believe you can write a book. Anyone here could write a book, right? I mean, you guys have figured out by now, uh, if you've been to discovery more than, than once, that, that being loud doesn't equal authority, right? You ever meet a obscurely famous programmer and they're maybe kind of a dick, 
<laughs> it tur turns out that anybody can be loud, right? Everything that I'm saying here, you should take and be suspicious of. Because just because I'm up here saying it and I'm loud about it doesn't mean that it's even remotely right. And that kind of... Uh, <laughs> It's not here yet. It's not here yet. But uh, hey, what was it that Jeff Atwood says, though? Is it uh, Jeff Atwood plays a lot of um, a rock band. He calls it fake plastic rock. And, and he says, you know, what he lacks in pure talent, he makes up for with enthusiasm. And I feel the same way about, about programming. You know, I don't have a lot of raw talent for, for programming, but I make up for it for enthusiasm. And uh, if someone goes Googling around for me uh, because I've left those footprints and, and I have that information uh, out on the web, I think that I'm going to have uh, a leg up on the other Scott that out, you know, the other Scott Hanselman out there who's trying to get a job. That poor guy. Looks like another Scott Hanselman in Vermont somewhere. He's a programmer. Poor guy. Yeah. So. Or maybe it's really great for him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about that theory? I think the theory is great, but. I don't have enough time in the day, and if you're blogging and then you get 10,000 responses and you want to try to read half of them. Okay, so hang on a second. So you just said that you're not blogging, I'm teasing you a little bit. You just said you're not blogging because you might get 10,000 responses, and then who would have the time to answer all of those responses? Hardly. So massive and overwhelming popularity is why you're choosing <laughs> 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 Not to blog. I barely have enough energy in the day for go to work, I'm on two kids, and... Oh, well, don't talk to me about children. I know. <laughs> I have two kids, and I just painted 416 feet of fence, and I put in three, and I put in three raised beds this weekend, uh, and I haven't blogged in a week though too. You have to find balance in all things, right? You have to you have to decide what you value. But what I decided was I was wasting two solid hours a day emailing internally to manage perceptions internally to get the couple of hundred people in my internal peer group to think I was cool, to reply to all and get in on the conversation. And I was not thinking about the other six billion people outside of the company. So I decided to take those two hours and think about managing my brand outside. This is a question. Are you, when you say you're blogging or emailing, are you like uh, posting something or are you asking a question? I mean, it seems like more, because um, when I email, the journalist just a gather knowledge, but blogging is more or less here, I'm posting this information, this is what I found, this is it, yeah, that sort of question. thing. So the perception that blog, that, that good blogging is making declarative statements about your knowledge, about saying, you know, here's something awesome I've discovered, and here's some source, and I'm awesome, and you should read this, and we'll all be awesome together. That's the sense that you get, and you're like, I don't want to blog, I'm not working at anything on the side. There's uh, there's nothing that I'm doing that is that you can't find in seventy thousand other blog posts though. Well, let's let's go see. I hit my blog, and let's go. Let's do this. Let's go back in time to. Uh, I'm totally just guessing. I haven't got anything like in my pocket, so I'm not going to be like yeah, smack down. I don't have any. Of that. <laughs> I'm guessing. I'm going to go back to like two thousand and four, right? So what is this? Five years now? Yeah. And just see what I was blogging about. Is this? Yeah, it's pretty good. Five years ago. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I was making declarative statements five years ago. Um, so I was doing end unit unit testing. This was I was working at uh, Check Free Carillion at the time, doing the bank. A little bit of code, talking about you know some of the crap we were doing. To uh, so that's a kind of a declarative thing. This was me saying, hey, I'm doing some unit testing and I think this is cool. So I achieved something. Um, here's me saying that uh, <coughs> that the next version of Windows should have more stuff in text mode. So I kind of was wrong there. <laughs> it's me making a big declarative statement about how Windows is missing the text mode boat. We all see how that worked out with the, uh, with the 3D and the, uh, the glass. There's me saying, here's a darn useful thing. So I discovered a link and I wanted to share it with people. You can notice that that's got no comments. Yeah. That's the kind of the typical blog thing. This is me learning. This is a throwaway. I posted a throwaway, and, and I'm going to use this segue to get into uh, ways to make your blog not suck that I've learned over the years. Uh, <coughs> Testdriven.net, here's me talking about how testdriven.net 1.0 is awesome. Here's what I want people to buy me for uh, Chris Mahana Quantica. Chris Mahana what? Chris Mahana Quantica. Festivus. That's not festive, Festivus, is that what we call it in the year? No. So this is, yeah, buy me these albums is basically what I'm saying. So that's kind of cheesy. 
Uh, then another, then another interesting one. Setting the title of the DOS command prompt from a batch file. A tiny victory. I learned how to do something and I belong to that, right? But it's, it's a little bit of a throwaway, but it's, it's nice and clear. I made things bold and red. That's probably getting traffic when people Google for how to do that. Maybe it was an obvious thing, but I, I did it. And I got four comments five years ago, so that's something. A review of, a, of Doom. That got huge traffic at the time. <laughs> Here's one. The, the people love this stuff. And this is, the, this is the thing that made my blog popular. And I started doing this five, six years ago. CSI, ASP.net. Where, and you, you, you guys have this happen all the time. There's so many interesting things in your, what you believe are boring lives that you could be blogging about. It's those little victories where you fight with something for five hours and you go, oh, it was this. Take ten minutes before you go and you know take that break, which is what happens after you solve those problems, and write it up. So <coughs> I was getting a really weird double HTTP get, I remember this, with, H, with, with Internet Explorer, and it was logging people out. And it turned out that when IE had the content filter on, which is the thing that keeps your kids safe, they were making a HTTP get, and the, on, on my site, the default um, page was logging people out by default. So anyone who ran content filter could only view one page, and then they were automatically logged out of the site. So we're getting some large percentage, like 1 or 2% of banking users are being logged out. And I used the uh, HTTP fiddler, yeah, 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 and I looked and I figured it out. And then rather than just taking that knowledge that had just been gained and throwing it out, I took a few minutes, I showed what happened, I kind of walked through a little CSI thing, and it was like, look at that, that's not even that much text. Right back out here. Too far. You know, it's mostly just some bullets. I said, and look, look how I wrote it up. I said, ah, oh, crap, where did it go? CSI. Sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to effectively make it so you guys can see stuff, because I, I want you to be able to see. Don't look at the text, but scenario problem forensics. That's how I laid it out. It's not like I'm writing stories <laughs> here. Nobody wants to read a story about a guy debugging. Yeah. I've just broke it down. Scenario. On Brian's machine, this happened. Da, da, da. And I started doing this. I started taking all of the kind of trials and tribulations and random stuff that would happen in my day. You guys read Mark Rusinovich's blog? You should. Mark Rusinovich is crazy smart, right? Obscenely smart and pretty too, which is really irritating. Because <laughs> um, there should be like a balance. There's like a cosmic balance. If your hair is really awesome, then you're kind of stupid. And then <laughs> he has nice hair and he's smart, PhD. Um, Rusinovich has this really great blog where it's like, you know, scenario my wife's machine, she installed a Zoom and da 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 da, and chaos ensues. And then boom, he goes into a kernel debugger and he figures it out. And then he says, and of course, you know, I knew this all the while, and I took it to the Windows team, and now it's fixed. And that's, that's his pattern. That's, that's his thing. That's what he blogs about. Life happens, and I document it. And, and it's interesting. So knowing your audience was a really important thing. Figuring out who is it I want. Is this a blog about technical stuff, or is this a blog about Ethiopian food? Because I might be into both things, and I might want to decide whether or not I want to split those blogs up into separate things. Who's my audience? To the point of the guy, I'm like, well, I don't know if my boss isn't going to like this. You can start a blog. Don't tell your boss. Don't mention your company. Put a disclaimer at the top and the bottom that this is about my you know, yada, 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 not the opinion of my employer. And don't ever put anything at all about any client or any code that is identifiable. Name everything foo and bar, and they'll never know. And you'll be a better person for it. If you get fired, I didn't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really old. I've got this, these stats are very, very old. But I, I figure out who my audience is. I use a tool called FeedBurner to, to manage my feeds. And they let me go and see where people are coming from. So this is a map here. It's kind of, a, it's kind of small. And now it's going to be small and pixelated, which is nice. Um, and these are all the tiny heads. I don't know what he's doing in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, of people who have come to my blog and then clicked, clicked on the map to say, hey, here's where I'm from. So I've got a real big uh, U.S. crowd, big in Europe, apparently, one guy in Iceland there, uh, Southern Africa, India, and Australia. So I can figure out who, who are these people who care about my blog. That's, that's really interesting. And then I can, when I found out that I had such an international crowd, that made me realize things about um, blogging things in U.S. dollars, using U.S. colloquialisms, and I started to change the way I phrased stuff, and people appreciated it. 
if I used an, an English colloquialism, I would link to the Wikipedia page explaining what whatever that you know turn of phrase was. Didn't didn't change. Didn't like take me any more time. It was simply the awareness of that. That oh yeah, not everybody who reads this blog speaks English. Now this one's one I break all the time, and this is a real tough one. And this is where you can get in trouble. Uh, keeping overtly personal information out of your blog. And this is about whether or not you want to blog and build a relationship with your readership or get involved in the community um, by virtue of your technical chops or by virtue of some aspect of your personality. And this is really touchy, feely, politically correct type stuff. So like for example, uh, I know somebody who has a, a technical blog uh, and they are also involved in the uh, lesbian, gay, tra transgender community and they had made a conscious decision to have their gay blog and their tech blog be separate. For fear of that, blogging about issues that that one community cares about on the tech blog would make some non-zero percentage of people reading the tech blog just not show up. I blogged about politics once, and I got destroyed. I put up some red, red state, blue state map, and, and I lost readers. And I had to ask myself, do I care or not? Now, if you don't care, yeah, knock yourself out. Have every other post be something about your religion or your uh, your culture or some something that can offend somebody. Or write a reasonably banal, uh, safe blog. I, I do that. You know, I'll blog about uh, my per, you know personal information that is non-controversial. If I wanted to talk about controversial stuff, I would do it on a blog that was set aside for controversial stuff. Which gets into the, the point of whether or not you want to be a dick publicly. <laughs> but then I blog about my kid anyway, and I get an achievement for that. <laughs> um, a lot of new bloggers spend time apologizing for not blogging enough, which is ordinarily you would think would be fine, but when you go to someone's website, like if I go to your website, it's like yourlastname.com, and the last post is you apologizing for not blogging, and it was four years ago. You know, I'm rededicating myself to blogging, April 2004. I'm back. Don't apologize for not blogging. I haven't blogged in a week, and I can feel it in my, you know, and I can, you know, losing readers, people don't care, but nothing interesting happened this week, so I have nothing to say. So I'm not going to feel bad. The world didn't end because I didn't blog. Uh, and avoid politics. This was a thing in New Zealand where, uh, this was like a really controversial cartoon in New Zealand when I gave this talk last, and, uh, always get into trouble. And this is, again, what I do. Don't blog bile. Bile, right? It's like, you know, what's, isn't like what comes out of your lymph, you know, lymph nodes. or where, Where's bile come from? Gallbladder? Yeah. Bile's gross. Don't give bile a permalink. Right? Don't be a dick. And being a dick, by the way, is a gender nonspecific thing, to be clear. Uh, uh, and, give, and give it a permalink. If someone can actually take a URL and give it to somebody and say, look, you know, Fred's a dick and here's a link to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> then you will get in trouble. That means Twitter too, and we'll talk about Twitter. Because Twitter is like IRC chat, which is great. Except every single thing you say has a link. So anytime that you're a dick, I have a link to that. I had a guy come in for an interview, and as with all people, as we all do, we Googled the guy. And what was the very, very first thing that I found was, let's say his name is Bob Johnson. I searched for Bob Johnson on the internet. First link was not a title of a blog post that said, you know, something about Bob Johnson. It was him talking about Fred, his previous CTO. And the title was, Fred is an asshat. So I looked up asshat. Turns out it's not a good thing. <laughs> I went to it, and this was this guy's personal blog where he used his CTO's full name and all sorts of offensive clip art to talk about what a complete a-hole his boss was. Okay? I mentioned it to him. The post mysteriously disappeared. I then told him about the caching system that Google puts in place. <laughs> never, ever give meanness or nastiness. Never argue on the Internet. I know that people, and this is, again, an opinion, right? Some people believe it, like, like uh, Torvalds, right? Linus, uh, Linux guy, always arguing. Uh, you can always find all sorts of places where he's been a jerk to somebody, but he doesn't care. I, I do. 
it, you'd be hard pressed to look over 10 years of internet traffic and find me being a dick. I could be wrong in a lot of places. I could be uh, incorrect, uh, completely off base, uh, uninformed, but you won't find me swearing. <coughs> there was actually an interesting Twitter um, tool. There's all these tools around Twitter where you can, uh, they're like third party tools where you can look at someone's timeline and say, you know, does he tend to tweet long tweets or short tweets? Does he swear a lot? Does he not swear a lot? It says that I swear as much as a children's TV presenter. They found one place on Twitter where I said the S word in three years of, of Twittering. And then I looked at another guy that I know, and it was just like every other word was just F bomb, F bomb, F bomb. It was just, if he didn't, you know, if he cared, he wouldn't do that. But I personally think that blogging bile will come back and it will bite him, yes. Just because all of my swearing now that's, that Paul is filming is going to be a problem. I'm going to have to keep all that out, Paul. <laughs> Uh, and think before you blog. Every single time where I've gotten nailed was when I blogged something without putting some thought into it ahead of time. And this is a problem because one of the unspoken things around putting stuff on the internet is that you'll never, ever get it back. You can delete it, and then you're going to get people blogging about the mysterious disappearing post by X. Every time I've tried to undo something on the internet, someone found it in Google Cache and blogged it themselves. And you see companies getting in trouble with this all the time. You gotta strike it out. Use the strike out command, right? And then say updated, put the time and what what what's going on. I've had posts that I've had to revise three, four, five times because they were just flat out wrong. But to change them and change history blindly is a real no no on the blogosphere. Don't don't post throwaways. I learned this. I kind of mentally set a limit about yay. Not about if I haven't got that much to say. Like as far as like how much fits on the screen, then I'm not even going to bother. Early on, I would be very enthusiastic, and I would basically post the the, the moral equivalent of those check this out emails. You know how hey check this out link. That may work in email. It doesn't work on on blogs. There are other services for that, like Delicious, and I'll show you how to use Delicious. Avoid excessive quoting. There's a famous famous blogger who got exceedingly famous by quoting way too much, and this is another real beginner mistake, where if more than half of your post is someone else's post, it's not your post. And this guy would have like a line, and then this much quoted text, and then a line, and then this much quoted text. So you know, adding a pithy statement and then copy-pasting someone's blog post is not blogging. It's called reblogging. So I, be, I have to be really careful to not excessively quote things. Uh, spell checking was a really important thing to do as, as well because when these things go out, people notice when you use your and your wrong, right? It, it may, it, it's um, someone called it the bozo bit. You know, when you get an email from somebody, even like a you know someone high up at your company, and they use your and your wrong. He's kind of go, he's president of a company. Seriously, spell check. But imagine that like amplified ten thousand times. So I actually have guys that check my spelling, and they, they email me immediately when they see it, and I update the post with the, the spelling. Um, paying attention to formatting. If you're going to blog, spend 50 bucks and hire one of those um, uh, those little blog theming sites to make something that's not the default theme. Have somebody design you a little logo or whatever. I'm not a designer at all, but I, I paid a guy to design my blog, and now it's pretty. And it seems like a small thing, but it's really, really difficult to stand out if you're using the, de the default theme, and if you don't care about formatting. You know how it is when you go to someone's blog and like one post is in like blue and aerial, and the next post is like Times New Roman, you know, 12 purple? It's just the guy doesn't care about the formatting. It's hard to see the content when you see that kind of visual noise. And one of my real uh, pet peeves are when people blog, but they don't have comments turned on. It just doesn't feel like a blog. The argument is always that, that there's too much spam, and I don't really buy that argument. Uh, there are tools to, to solve the spam, the spam problem. Uh, I don't like going to, like, well, like Paul Graham's site that we just looked at about why nerds are not popular. He's got no comments there. So then that's just him yelling from the top of a building, and no one gets to talk back. The re if, you, if you really are successful at blogging, you'll find you'll, you are most successful when the comments are more interesting than your posts. That's when you have gotten a successful blog. 
So there's tools that I can turn you on to and solve comments then. Um, going up on Technorati and claiming your feed and making sure that people know that you're out there are really, really low effort ways to let people know that you are out there. This one got me into a lot of trouble. It turns out that early on there were 11 different ways to get to my blog. Every single one of those URLs, including this one and that one, are different URLs. <coughs> and all of them were valid ways to get to my blog. So Google thought that I had a lot of different ways to get to my blog. Therefore, uh, I had a low page rank. So I put in a little effort and I did some URL rewriting and I standardized on, on just one format for my blog. <coughs> if you enter in any of these, you'll get a redirect, a 301 permanent redirect. And that was my way to say to Google, funnel all of that to this one location. That way I didn't think I was 11 different people. Seems silly, but that's the web for you. I started using simple URLs for popular posts. Everyone who starts a blog will basically talk in, in a vacuum for months. No one will visit. No one will care. And then one of your posts will get on dig or get requoted or some famous blogger will mention it. And then that will become the post that everyone knows you for. For me, it was the tools list. I wrote a tools list. It was all the different free utilities that a developer can use. But it was a really, really long URL, and that made it really difficult to tell people to go visit it. So once it became popular, I just made a little redirect. So you go to hanselman.com slash tools, which I just gave you, and you can see my tools list, and you'll get a redirect to the giant URL. Same thing with this, this presentation here. You can get a lot more detailed information about this presentation at hanselman.com slash suck less. That'll happen to you too. Everyone's got the one or two po who, who are the bloggers here? A couple blog. Tell me, do you have a post or two that became like the one that gets all the traffic because it solved some problem or it did something that is like stands out amongst you? What's your like? Do you know, do you know off the top of your head what's your most popular post? I kind of run Vista X64 on the Mac Pro. See, he took the time to put that knowledge out there, talking about all sorts of topics that are not that topic, right? He doesn't blog about that kind of stuff all the time. And this is always how it works. You blog about one topic you think everyone's deeply interested in, and then one day you decide to add more RAM to your home server. And then that becomes the most popular thing you've ever written. <laughs> how to get Vista 64 running on your MacBook. And, that's, and then that's his thing. So, you know, make it a short URL, and then you can hand it up. Right? If you get a popular post, use it. And then actually, one of the things that I did, once I got people showing up, I mean, delete, I'm going to delete uh, cookies and show you a little trick. So deleting my cookies to pretend that it's the first time I've ever shown up at my site. I started noticing that I had posts like that that were getting all sorts of, of hits. I'm like, well, how am I going to capitalize on that? So I wrote a little macro that said, first time here, check out my greatest hits. Or read a post from the archives, thanks for visiting. And then the first <coughs> five times that they visit the blog, they see that and then it goes away. And then later on, I added one that said, hey, for the first five times, I see it five times and never again, do you tweet, follow me on Twitter. And then I started to kind of siphon people off because they would start to show up looking for MacBook Pro tips or whatever. And then you bring them in. This is personal brand management. It could all, you could also call it kind of blog whoring, but uh, <laughs> you can look poorly upon me for doing this, right? Or you could say I'm paying attention. It is, in my opinion, these little kind of things here that separate kind of the wheat from the chaff. This is where uh, literally 20 minutes time and an idea added 10% to my subscribers. Now, that assumes I care about subscribers, right? So you can always, you can always play that kind of popularity game. Like, well, what is that you trying to accomplish here, man? You know, are you trying to be popular, you know? Popular, and then you get back to that whole nerds and popularity thing, right? Do you value it or do you not? It makes interviews easier, yeah. right? So I don't need to worry. I, I got about a 50-50 chance going to an interview that someone's heard of me, so that's good. Um, if they haven't heard of me, which is a 50-50 chance, right, I can be pretty sure that if they go and they go on the Google and they Google for Scott, 
that I'm below the bathroom tissue people. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Scott, bathroom tissue. Boy, two ahead of the goo. Yeah, it, it's got goo down here, very low. <laughs> yeah, so, so the point is that they'll, they'll know where I am. I think it makes me a better writer. I think it allows, it, it, it lets me know that I'm getting better. I haven't reached any level or pinnacle of any kind. But I must know that I'm, I'm pretty good at expressing technical concepts to people in a reasonably effective way. So if the job is for technical writing, I can say, well, here's some of my writing. It allows me to Google myself, not in an ego Googling way, but in a, uh, if, you've had, if anyone has ever had a blog for any period of time, you'll know that you've reached some level when you Google for a question and find your blog as the answer. <laughs> that will happen, and it is the weirdest feeling, because just as we want to be connected, that we do this to be connected to the community, when you Google for something and you find yourself as the only answer, that is the most lonely feeling <laughs> that you can possibly imagine, that I'm the only person who ever cared enough about the XML serializer to, to blog about that particular thing. But this is why I blog, it, not for the, the fame and, uh, and uh, the women, but it's for this. <laughs> this is my archives. See the scroll bar on the right there? There's something to be said for having written an ass load and being able to go and search it. I'm not a guy that digs a daily diary. But the fact that we could just go and see what I was looking at in November of 2004, was pretty darn cool. And you don't get that until a year or so. But once you've done a year and you go back and you go, wow, that's really cool. Like if we go to April 2002. Well, it's up. After screwing with FTP permissions on and off for a week, my blog is up. Uh, sigh, I'm blogging, we'll see how long it lasts. Right? That's day one. And I don't know what the hell I was doing here. I mean, what is wrong with that title? Very cool non I think that's space. a non-breaking space there, so I think I've got some formatting issues from oh, okay. seven years ago. That's a non-breaking space. I think I probably wrote some utility to strip out stuff and I didn't unencode my entities, right? But that's April of 2002, so gosh, what is that now? Seven years? Yeah. That's cool. Being able to do that is, is very is very comforting. And then the next thing I said was, I'm writing a pile of C-sharp lately. Right? Talked about my diabetes. Today was the longest, dullest day in the history of mankind. Early reports have today's 8.30 to 5 time period lasting no fewer than 34 hours. Breaking the previous records of 33 hours said sometime during my junior high school years. <laughs> <laughs> so repartee is a lot. <laughs> This is the kind of high quality content that you know I have looked forward to for so many, many years. Um, one way to get started with the blog is uh, to jumpstart a blog is to have a garage sale. Uh, we all have a C colon WAC dev folder or C colon WAC projects or whatever full of crap we've written in the past. <laughs> right? But it's not doing anyone any good. Look through it. Have a garage sale. Put it out on the net and, and write some posts. Think about some of the little utilities that you've never released that, uh, that highly, you know, that tune the garbage collector, Jeffrey, and if you've never given to the people, you're holding back on us, sir. Uh, you have these, these projects. You have these things you never quite finished. Talk about them. Have a garage sale. It's a great way to start out. License your blog. Make sure that you tell people how you want your content used. Go to Google for Creative Commons and decide how you want to license your blog. It's really cool if you go to Creative Commons because you can just say, Creative Commons. They have a little wizard where you can say, uh, 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 license your work. <laughs> Do you want to allow commercial uses? No. Allow modifications? Yes, as long as others share alike. Jurisdiction, US, da 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 select a license. Here is the license. You have chosen the Creative Commons Share and Share Alike US license. Hmm. Now you have just kind of copyrighted your work and decided that you want people to use all of your content. 
except as long as they share alike. You want to make sure that if they do something with it, then they're going to turn around and give it back. And you don't want to allow commercial stuff. So you take a look at that little dollar sign with the slash through it. 